Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of uh, the Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung and the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet Society to our first lecture after a lengthy summer break. For those of you who are here for the first time, the lecture series Making Sense of the Digital Society is co-organized by two organizations, the Federal Agency of, Ed of Civic Education and the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet Society. The purpose of this lecture series is to make sense of the digital transformation in a broader sense. We invite thinkers, sort of um, prominent academics, to shed light for us on the issues they find central when it comes to the transformation of the society, to give us explanations, but also to talk about the sort of theoric, theoretical background of what we are seeing. Um, what is important to us is that we try to cultivate a European perspective on the digital transformation. Today, we are very pleased to have Stephen Graham with us, whose work focuses on the transformation of cities. Toby Müller will introduce Stephen to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeanette Hofmann, for this uh, introduction. Thank you, the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society and the Federal Agency for Civic Education for having me once again as moderator of this um, series. Um, I think my colleagues did not choose this place for nothing here at uh, Holzmarkt, a very beautiful place. It's the first time I'm here, right in here. I know a little bit uh, of the area around here. It was a highly contested uh, area in um, Berlin city planning. A lot of questions of urbanism have been discussed around um, this uh, Holzmarkt. Uh, some of you remember the term media spray maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, and apparently you can see that this is not really what investors' architecture looks like all over the world. There are, you know, um, the cooperative models that are being tried out here um, and so forth, questions of who is the city uh, going to sell to and so forth. So that's why we're here tonight. Uh, a little bit on the format of this evening, for those of you who are here for the first time, there's going to be, of course, the talk uh, of our dear guest tonight. Then we're going to have a conversation, just the two of us, for maybe about 20 minutes, and then it's your turn. There's microphones here, and there's also a Twitter wall, um, hashtag digital society, where you can ask questions. The Twitter wall will not be uh, up here, so as not to distract our conversations, but at one time during the discussions, I'm going to ask... Um, uh, a colleague of mine uh, who uh, sums up some of the questions you are able to ask on Twitter. Also, the people uh, who are watching the live stream of this discussion tonight, and all of this is going to be broadcasted on the respective websites of the partners of this evening. Our guest uh, today has contributed to European urban studies for well over two decades, you could say, but I wonder if it is safe to say that cities are back with a vengeance, at least a retro-futuristic uh, outlook on cities even. I remember in the mid-70s when I was a kindergarten kid, I was visiting my dad. He was a teacher, but in Switzerland it was possible for him to have a sabbatical in Vienna. And uh, I was really excited to actually, for the first time in my life, to see a city coming from Switzerland that doesn't really have cities, uh, so to speak, of in a global uh, perspective. And I was very disappointed because there were no skyscrapers at all. It was just an old city to me. And I think this dream, this childlike dream of a vertical city, so to speak, of a very tech-driven uh, city is at the heart of Stephen's um, talk tonight. Later, then I did some studies in Detroit, and that wasn't really my dream of a skyscraper and tech-driven cities either, so I'm very uh, um, excited about what Stephen has to say. 
I don't think Stephen will reject all those childlike dreams of a vertical uh, and tech-driven cities. He's just focusing more on the downsides of it, of the interests that are at play in a city like that, at the hidden agendas, at the unveiled or veiled infrastructures he's going to talk about that cities have. Stephen is from the northeast of England. He studied geography first and later city planning. There's a lot of Berlin experts here tonight, I am told, in the audience, so this would be interesting um, in the talk with the audience later on. He worked for the city of Sheffield uh, for a couple of years and stayed true to the north, so to speak. Further studies led him um, to Manchester while continuing um, working for the School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape in Newcastle, where he's actually from. He was visiting prof at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, I'm sure you all know. Then he taught at Durham University as professor of human geography. In 2010, he returned to Newcastle, then as professor of cities and society. In 2001, I read today uh, on Wikipedia, actually, I have to admit, he attended a military conference by mistake, uh, so to speak, and uh, this really did alter, I think, his work, how the military complex affects urban infrastructure. I'm sure we're going to hear about that outlook on cities as well later on. Cities Under Siege um, is a book called from 2010, Adverso, is one of the many testimonies to that Outlook. Much of what we are about to hear tonight goes back to the anthology Disrupted Cities When Infrastructure Fails, which he edited. His latest monography deals with the, again, childlike, but it's in its core, probably modern notion of the city I hinted at earlier. It's called Vertical Cities, the city from satellite to bunkers. I'm sure uh, we will hear about this shifting perspective too, from sprawl to consolidation, so to speak, from the author himself. Now, please, a very warm welcome to Stephen Graham. Graham, I'm sorry. Um, thank you very much, Toby. Um, thanks very much to to Jeanette and to Christian and to everybody involved in the, the Humboldt Institute tonight. It's a, a real honor and a real pleasure to say a few words and to introduce a few lines of thought about this question of infrastructure. It's a word that gets used widely in, in all of the European languages. It's a word that gets used incredibly widely in, in, the, in the sense of uh, everyday speech but it's a word that's rarely defined. It's a word that is often absent in terms of clinical definition. Do we have the slides? Oh, I need to just... Uh, hang on a minute. Infrastructure, right? <laughs> which, which button? Digital infrastructure is even more confusing than analog infrastructure. There we go. Thank you. Okay, we got there in the end. So the title of what I have to say is The Politics of Digital Infrastructure in Cities, okay? And I want, to, I want to get you to think through what we mean by infrastructure, both in an urban context, a city of four or five million people like Berlin, but in a society where the digital is pervading everything, where the digital is mediating every micro aspect of every dimension of our lives. And this is a transformation that has come on um, in a profoundly rapid and unpredictable and sometimes bewildering way. So let's kick off with the obvious point that cities are and cities always have been the sort of key hubs of infrastructural society. We're going right back to the origins of cities. They are always the hubs that concentrate infrastructure that become possible through infrastructure. And in the latest transformations of digitized infrastructure and digital infrastructure, we're just seeing the, la the, the latest manifestation of a very old process. And in a way, infrastructures historically, in terms of modern cities, industrial cities, have been a way of making what geographers call nature 
into culture. They bring all of the resources, all of the uh, water, energy and food and communications into cities from all of the distant hinterlands that serve cities. Often that's very contested and so on. And they, they move all of the things out of cities that we want to leave. We want to remove through the wastes and, and uh, outputs of, of the city. These can be in gas form, through pollution. They can be in water form. They can be in produced form, all of the products and services. So digital media are interfacing with big questions about who we are as people. Our very bodies are caught in these webs of infrastructure. And these are webs of infrastructure that are often invisible. Without the infrastructure, we simply can't live. That's the bottom line. If you imagine Berlin without the vast array of um, food infrastructures, logistics infrastructures, energy, water, waste, as well as digital media, which allows all the rest to function these days, we would be in a state of massive crisis. You try living without electricity for a week, and you start to realize that the always-on, switched-on, infrastructural city is always, always linked to those flows. Okay, that raises a few questions that I'm going to concentrate on. Firstly, I want us to ask the question, what infrastructure actually is? And as I said before, there's a startling lack of really good social science literature, which really tries to define this, this word we use so readily. Secondly, I want us to look at the question of digitization and how does the digitization not only of the city but of all the other infrastructures of the city raise questions about equality and social exclusion and thirdly I want to look at the uh, question of the smart city this is a, a language and a paradigm that's really powerful in terms of thinking through how digital technology can be harnessed to a city's future, very contested. And I want to look into some of those ideas and perhaps to criticize them. And finally, I want to explore some of the work that Toby was discussing, which is to look a little bit at how, in, how we understand more about infrastructures when they're taken away. Somehow you learn a lot more about a power grid or an internet system if it's actually removed from you. There's a paradox there that's always very interesting, I think. Okay, um, so I have to turn to look at the slides, so I'm going to try and angle the microphone here. Um, in terms of defining infrastructure, I think the best, the best academic source is a wonderful anthropologist called Susan Lee Starr, who's sadly no longer with us, um, but she wrote this really powerful work where she really went into the fine grain of the things we name as infrastructure the things we actually encompass within that term. And there are a lot of technical questions here. She talks about them offering spatial and temporal reach, so connecting other times and places to where you are now. She talks about the fact that you have to learn how to use infrastructure, whether it be turning a tap on as a child, learning how to use toilets, cars, electricity plugs, and so on, and obviously the vast and complex world of learning how to use digital media, which seems to be reinvented every five minutes, for a 53-year-old man like me anyway, right? <laughs> um, it's linked to conventions of practice. So there are all sorts of cultures and norms about how we use these vast arrays of technologies. It embodies standards. Think about the different plugs you have to carry around the world because of the inherited um, technologies of different national power systems. It's built in sunk into sunk, what they call sunk capital. Sorry, this sounds like a dry economics lecture. It will make sense later on. So it's sunk into the world around us to allow us to move all sorts of things around. It's fixed in what she calls modular increments. So continually added to. You don't build an entire global power system all at once. You don't build an entire global airport system all at once. And it's complicated, as people in Berlin know, with the, the Schoenfeld uh, story. It's embedded. 
So infrastructure gets sunk into all the other aspects of life. And that word is interesting because, as I say, it's often forgotten about once it's there. It's often forgotten about until it doesn't work. And finally, it's transparent, which means that when you send, um, when you start a car, you don't need to think about all of the different things that are going on to allow you to drive the car. As when you get on a train, it's not, it's not a long, complex process. You're just getting on the train and going. There is a ninth feature, which I will return to. But this definition of infrastructure, I think, helps us to be quite precise about what digital digitization does to infrastructure. Because it builds on the, the history of how electricity, of how communication systems like telegraph and telephone systems, how water systems, metro, subway, urban, of how all of the other grids that built modern cities like Berlin came to be in place. They came to be in place, and once all those systems were built, we tended to do what sociologists call black box the technology. What that means is you just treat it as something to use. You don't go into all of the details inside each system each time you use it. So when infrastructures work best, they're noticed least of all. That's the quote from a colleague, David Perry. This is an image of when infrastructures were not working well. This is an image from Manhattan in 1884 when they were just starting to string telephone lines around the city. Each one of those lines is a telephone line. It was chaos. This was before the telephones became black boxed. Once the blizzards brought all of these things down, they were put underground. And then you could just pick up the phone and it would be connected, and that was the end of the story. Ele electricity was very much at the center of these transformations, and this city was the electrical metropolis par excellence. In the 1920s, especially in the Weimar period, um, there was a huge excitement that Berlin's massive growth into the, the industrial superpower um, quite late in the day compared to Britain and France, was fueled by a huge advanced electrical infrastructure that was very much the focus of, of, of conversation. Who now thinks of electricity as the cutting edge of infrastructure? But in 1930s, it very much was. So what about digitalization? Okay, What about how t IT coming into the scene, changes places, changes people, and changes cities. Well, there was a long tradition, particularly in North America, of seeing it in a very sort of, I think, quite a naive way. The assumption, particularly between the 1960s and the 1980s, as you see with some of these quotes, I'm not sure if they're legible to everybody, was that because you could move more and more information over faster and faster communications grids, culminating in optic fibers and global satellite networks and so on, cities would somehow cease to exist. Okay, we would somehow all be able to do anything anywhere. And I find this particularly fascinating because I was hearing about the location of the Humboldt Institute Institute today and how it being close to the parliament buildings and to the center of Berlin was absolutely pivotal to its success. Historically, a lot of people like Marshall McLuhan thought the city was anachronistic, it was old-fashioned, it was going to be literally disinvented as people could do all of their communication remotely from wherever they wanted to live. So if you look at some of these quotes, Martin Pauli, an architect, says, uh, in urban terms, once time has become instantaneous, you can send anything anywhere, any time, at light speed, space becomes unnecessary. There's almost a sense that we're going to inhabit cyberspace. And cyberspace was very much seen as a separate world in the, in the 80s and the 90s. Marshall McLuhan says, the city is a form of major dimensions, and this is in 1964, must inevitably dissolve like the fading shot in a movie. 
So why has that not come to pass? We are now living in the most urbanized age in the history of our world, and it's the most digitized age in the history of our world. My argument is that's not a surprise. My argument is that digital media, digital technologies facilitate urbanization and relate really closely and subtly to the fact that we're all here today. If, in, if media was so fantastic, why would, why would you all come here to see a face-to-face -face exposition of an argument? You know? Place still matters, and arguably matters as much as ever, despite the incredible growth of digital technologies. Sorry, there's a bit of text in this one, but I think it's worth reading. The response to people who saw cyberspace as a separate world that we would somehow start inhabiting in a sort of VR sense was most powerfully expressed by two media theorists in the United States, um, J. David Bolter and Richard Grusin. And they said, rather than substitute for the city or the body or the book or the street or the newspaper or the building, all of these technologies were actually what they called remediating those things. So let me just go through this quote, and you might get a sense of what they mean by that. It's really quite subtle. So they say, cyberspace is very much part of our contemporary world. It is made through these remediations. So as a digital network, it remediates electric communications. So telephone, telegraph, and so on. It remediates painting, film, and television. So none of those have gone away. They've had to be digitized and are now organized and consumed and produced through digital media, which has profound implications. As social spaces, um, it, it webs into physical place and physical contact in all sorts of complex ways. So these new media, and this is going back to 1990s, this, this was deemed to be quite a revelation, given this weight of debate from North America that somehow cities were going out of fashion. What the uh, argument is, that far from going out of fashion, these digital media reanimate and reorganize places in ways that are so, so important and so hard to understand, because they're so political and yet so hidden. And I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. So let's just take some examples. Just think, I would say, of this humble device in your pocket. Think how the smartphone has remediated the camera, the video camera, the map, cartography, computer databases, the telephone, rather obviously, global navigation systems, and so on and so forth, global retail and shopping and logistics systems. Because that phone is a portal into a an unknowably complex set of infrastructures that straddle the world. Every time you use the GPS on that system, you are connecting to 24 geostationary satellites owned by the US Air Force that are the same things used to drop bombs on targets in Afghanistan. Okay. Behind this front end is this vast backstage, the backstage of global information infrastructure. Think of the book. Everyone was saying the book is dead. You know, the book is doomed. We're all going to have kinders and e-readers and so on. But it's not the case. You know, books are now organized and consumed in all sorts of different ways, but the physical artifact has almost an extra pull. Yes, bookstores are dying, but there's as many books printed as, as ever. Think about the body. Think about how digital bodies are being reorganized and um, interfaced with all sorts of technologies through sort of cyborg type transformations. Think of EasyJet and how the front end of the cheap airline system, with you doing all the work rather than a travel agent, has completely transformed global, global airline flows. We don't sit all at home um, in, in our little VR caves doing virtual tourism. We're traveling more and more around the world between cities, which has huge impacts for big tourist cities like, like Berlin because of the Airbnb boom, which is another platform which reorganizes urban space 
and so on. Think about streets, think about um, global spaces, think about the globe, uh, and so on and so forth. So I, I would argue that you know, the best way of us thinking about these subtle transformations in the relationship between digital media and place and bodies and cities is this concept of remediation, how the old is remediated into all sorts of new dynamics, which has really profound implications because of the ease of connecting through platforms. I'll give you one example. The Guardian, traditionally the left-leaning newspaper in the UK, only read by physically printing the actual paper, transporting it across the UK, a very UK-centered audience, that physical logistics. Now it's the biggest left-leaning newspaper in North America. Okay? It's hardly printed at all, and that print run is threatened. Some newspapers are not doing it at all. But it doesn't go out of business. It reorganizes itself as a platform for digital content that's globally accessible. But let's not forget that internet infrastructure is physical too. Too much of that 80s and 90s stuff was suggesting that somehow the virtual, the cyber, was just going to arrive as if by magic everywhere and any time. This is profoundly geographical. It exists in some places and not in others. And cities generally have a huge advantage because of the way they concentrate the best digital communications infrastructure. I have two teenage sons, 18 and 19. They go into a cold sweat if they don't have broadband uh, digital media access saturating their lives. And they basically don't get that in rural England. And they genuinely have psychological disturbances. Okay. <laughs> um, but it's not just about the actual cables and satellites of the global internet system and its associated financial media and so on systems. There's a huge array of other infrastructures that sustain that. Think of the electricity system that drives internet. You know, it, it consumes vast amounts of energy. Think of, does anyone know what this is? This is the internet, by the way. Well, it's part of the internet, this thing we call the internet. Any suggestions? This is a cooling complex um, of one of the hundreds of Google server farms that are being located all around the world near cheap energy. Some, they're increasingly moving to higher latitudes. But global warming is forcing them to go further and further north. So uh, at some stage, there's going to be vast amounts of server farms cooled by these enormous cooling systems because of the heat they generate, moving higher and higher in the global latitudes. It's a fascinating and poorly discovered process. When do you ever think of this when people talk about the internet? This is the backstage, but it's profoundly important materially and environmentally. So that's the question of what infrastructure is, okay? I want to move now on to the question of smart cities. It's a word that's everywhere, just as digital cities were or virtual communities were 20 years ago or cyberspace perhaps 25, 30 years ago or wired cities in the 1960s. There's a very long history um, to the idea of political and governance communities, uh, real estate organizations, place marketing organizations trying to sell their cities by making them look high tech. Remember Berlin with its electricity infrastructures? in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, the last 30 or 40 years, it's been profoundly about who's more digital and more futuristic, as we were hearing with Toby. And the smart city rhetoric is powerful at the moment. It's coming out of the, corp the IT corporations, it's coming out of the cities themselves and the real estate organizations and so on. And it builds on a whole set of debates um, that surround pervasive and ubiquitous computing and the way it's permeated everyday life in terms of bodies, buildings, cities, spaces and infrastructures. Um, on the back of the internet of things, uh, ubiquitous computing, social media, the massive growth of 
uh, Google Earth and based cartography and navigation systems. Um, and it's very much a sort of cybernetic idea that this time, despite all of the failures with previous information systems in cities, we will have perfect information. We will have perfect optimization. We will be able to control all of the complex systems that connect cities in terms of nature, ecology, infrastructure, services, government, and so on. Here's a great quote from IBM. This is the, the image that often dominates smart cities debates, the well-known and incredibly well-photographed um, control room in Rio that was put together on the back of the huge investment in the uh, Olympic and World Cup programs. IBM, one amongst many big IT corporations, trying to get into what they call the urban operating system world, uh, trying to colonize all of the sort of backstage of cities in terms of their data, their software, their operating systems. IBM described the problem as uh, thus. Today's cities are based on separate domains, right, with no real ability to be managed as an entire entity. So too fractured, too disparate, too confusing. City managers have no single place to get the real-time status. They want the updates to the minute, cybernetic style, or historical reports. Daily operations generate vast amounts of data from many different sources, but cities lack the ability to extract meaningful information. It's sort of the fog of war, the chaos of situated life in a big urban administration. Not surprisingly, the likes of IBM say they have the solution. The solution is the smart city. It's their smart city, it's not Cisco's or or Hitachi's or whoever else. And it's this sort of thing, which is a very old idea. If anyone's been interested, done any research on the history of cybernetics, that was a very urban idea post-1940s. A lot of, the, lot of urban management, urban governance techniques in the states were bringing in military notions about cybernetic control of highway planning and housing planning and welfare systems and so on. And this is an example of, say, the mundane world of traffic regulations, how you can bring all of those different databases together, make them talk to each other, have this clarity, have this perfect knowledge that's often being discussed. What's very important, I think, given what Toby was saying about this urge to be futuristic, this urge to sell your city as a high-tech hub, as a center of digital innovation and so on, is it's about symbolic power. The symbolic power of the digital, but also the symbolic power of new physical landscapes. And the history of all of these projects is very much to sell the future. William Gibson famously said that the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed, right? Now, a lot of city agencies and developers are trying to say, we are here, we are the future. Dubai is fantastic at this. Dubai has actually employed um, futuristic sci-fi uh, script editors and, and thinkers to say, how can we look like the future? The guy that designed the Burj Khalifa, the tallest tower in, um, in Dubai, is actually employed by the biggest skyscraper uh, architects in the world, SOM, in uh, Chicago. And he said he wanted it to look like the Emerald City in The Wizard of Oz. Right? So there's a really interesting de debate here about how so much of these future cities are being sold and made and rendered through very bad CGI very often to look like a sort of 1950s vision of the future. So we're looking at retro-futurism now to create cities in the future. Very interesting. Um, so we've had classic examples like Songdo in South Korea. Many of these never get built, but they become icons of the imagination, even without their material emergence. We're getting the big architects, the star architects of this world, like Foster coming in to do ecological cities in, uh, in the Gulf, a very lucrative 
fees, I'm sure. These are being sold as green, as, as being sustainable, as in ways that um, reduce resource use and do a lot more recycling and so on. This is um, Mazda City in Abu Dhabi. What's very often lacking is a social component. What's very often lacking are people, which I think is the really interesting question about smart cities. Where do you ever see a human being on these images or on these diagrams? They are often highly elitist and highly technocratic. Perhaps the most troubling example I can find at the moment is an island which is literally being built out of the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Lagos in Nigeria, the biggest city in Nigeria, which is effectively a sort of elite apartheid bubble for real estate interests to colonize, away from the chaotic and flood-prone landscapes of the lagoons of, of Lagos. This is called Eco-Atlantic. Have a look at it on Google Earth. It's pretty, pretty startling. What's also been sold are new ways of life. New ways of life. And this is a very dated version of new ways of life. But very often, these are about new interfaces. They're a sort of Google Glass type notion of the future, which is about augmented reality. A new digitized interfaces between you, your body, your senses, and the wider city. So this is a sort of augmented reality notion. Very sort of... Um, very sci-fi again, drawing on a myriad of dystopian sci-fi um, films, probably most notably Minority Report, with the whole idea of the city sensing your location, feeding you data through a whole load of, uh, sort of database systems that are connecting your historic preferences to your location, and then you become a marketing opportunity. A lot of the smart city rhetoric is actually about how do you harvest data? How do you commercialize data from the massive amount that we're generating all the, day, all the time through our digital presence and our digital activities? This is a, perhaps a satirical take on where this might go if we have complete collapse of privacy, we have complete collapse of data regulation. Um, people talking satirically about post-privacy um, advertising and, and the ways in which this could completely challenge all sorts of notions of anonymity. And I think this raises all sorts of questions about the history of cities in the modern industrial period because for many subcultural groups, uh, many people fleeing the conservatism of village life, the city was vastly um, seductive because of its anonymity. Okay. That was a big part of the pull, the sense of being absorbed into the mass. That was also why the city was such a threat, such a constant threat to political elites in terms of revolution and insurrection. So what happens to, to those traditions of urbanism, urban political mobilization, in a world which is increasingly tracked, monitored, and, and sensed uh, in, to, in, in a profoundly... Uh, intense way which challenges all sorts of questions of anonymity and privacy. Sorry. But there is a more upsetting and worrying aspect of this and I know that some of the debates in this, uh, th these lectures the series have talked about this and that's when you organize cities as vast arrays of software, the agency increasingly is the software. There's no way human agency can monitor and, and organize all of the actions, all of the activities, all of the infrastructural flows in cities. And once the agency is the software itself, the politics of the city increasingly is defined by who writes that software. How does the software differentiate between people in the city? This is what I call the concept of the software sorted city. And it's going on all the time. It's going on in ways that are often profoundly invisible. I'll give you one example. This is a very early example, which stills, still includes a human in the interface. We're not talking about complete artificial intelligence in this example. If you ring a lot of the call centers, UK, but also elsewhere in the world, your um, phone number is automatically sensed by the call center management system. 
and you are actually cued differently depending on your previous behavior as a customer. Okay. So, for example, a very well-off, uh, good consumer will be answered straight away. You will be bypassing the queue. Someone who's a long-term poor payer, poor debtor, poor consumer will be, will be hanging on. So, so much of this, the politics of what's going on in these smart cities, the worry is, will be orchestrated in ways that are really hard to get at in terms of mobilization, activism, and regulation. This is getting more powerful because of the shift towards smart video technologies. There are video surveillance systems all over the world now. The numbers are staggering, um, particularly in, in parts of the UK, actually. Again, that's shifting to automation and what's called video analytics. So rather than having the bored person eating the sandwich, half asleep, trying to monitor the technology, increasingly the video is computerized, digitized, and the software is making decisions about what is a threat and what needs to be protected. Again, totally political. Um, this is one example which, are worry, which worries a lot of people, and I'm sure there are many others. This is an example of a video system that was tried out in Boston about seven or eight years ago, um, where basically the software detected a, a man getting out of a car and a cyclist. The man, getting out, oh, excuse me, the man getting out of the car was deemed to be under threat. The cyclist was deemed to be the threat. So again, it's a profound sense of somehow the programming of the software shapes the right to the city. But of course, this gets even weirder and even scarier when you start to see entirely automated urban infrastructures. Um, the, the example which is getting a lot of attention at the moment is the big push by the likes of Uber for entirely driverless vehicles, entirely driverless cars, trucks, um, buses, and eventually aircraft that will be the great, what they call, disruptor, challenging mass transit systems, conventional human-based auto systems. There's a big, big push there. Again, inspired by historical ideas of the future. How many sci-fi films have you seen without automated vehicles or flying cars, right? But here, this is what we're what the Guardian is calling Franken algorithms, because already people are being hit by these vehicles. A woman was killed in March 2018 as a cyclist on the side of the highway when Uber was doing one of its autonomous vehicle tests. The suggestion is that the various sensors in the car linked to the computerized control systems of the car, they use LiDAR and radar and all sorts of different sensors, um, detected the woman but deemed it to be a non-human. A non so down at that micro scale, um, we, we're seeing a radical intensification of the politics of the smart city. And as I hinted at before, there's another sort of subtext to this because so much of the new infrastructures coming into cities are ostensibly about making you bike around cities nice, in, a, in a cool way or... Um, having really useful search engines or what have you, or driving in autonomous vehicles. But the bottom line is that the profit, very often, from these infrastructures is about harvesting data. It's about selling data within very complex marketplaces. And of course, we're seeing the likes of, of Apple and Google and so on become the platform for such huge swathes of the world's economy that it, again, masses enormously how those platforms develop, how they prioritize different sources of information, different services, different locations within, within the city. Things that are very often um, poorly understood, deemed to be uh, proprietary, very badly regulated in terms of nation states and data protection agencies. We're seeing hints of this with the exposures of the Cambridge Analytica crisis and, and uh, scandal. We're seeing hints of this with some of the exposures about Facebook and some of the others. We see hints of all of this stuff 
with various cracks in the edifice, um, but it's very hard to get a sustained understanding of the politics and social effects of how all that data is harvested, sold, and then, and then passed on. You see, the imp you see the implications with the scary way in which ads follow you around, of course. And the scary way in which your consumer behavior on one system will migrate strangely around the various other systems that you, that you use. And perhaps a final aspect of this is the efforts, as I said, by a whole load of different companies to try and build new ways of moving. New ways of moving goods, new ways of moving people. Already, um, the Amazon equivalent in Israel, Israel? Where did that come from? Iceland, that doesn't look like Israel to me, is, is offering home delivery through the, the drone. It seems to be the sort of killer idea for so much of the smart city debate. It's a bit like the smart fridge was for the smart home debate about 20 years ago. As long as the fridge can order milk, we will have digital utopia, right? Now it's as long as the burger can be brought to you through the air, we will have digital, tech, digital nirvana. Um, and this is Dara Korosvari's argument. He's the chief of one of the big Uber pushes into the aerial challenge. He says, a key to solving urban mobility is to fly burgers, you know. <laughs> Some strange stuff flies around these debates. Um, but again, massive amounts of R&D. All of our colleagues in aeronautical departments in universities, in IT departments in universities, all feverishly at work on so much of these, these events. I think there are 35 sky taxi projects being, being launched. These are not for flying burgers, these are for flying people. They're very much a response to the congestion of cities because everybody's congesting into big cities. They're getting very, very hard to move around. Well, why not go into the vertical dimension and exploit new motor technology, new battery technology, and all of the smart city technologies around navigation and make them autonomous? I think there may be a, a consumer a resistance to strapping yourself in autonomous vehicles putting your credit card through a slot and just saying, okay, here we go. Um, but it's all about faith and trust. Who knows, maybe this will take off. But it's a very contested issue that's very much embraced, being embraced by those cities whose elites are trying to be the future. So not surprisingly, a lot of these are having their trials in, you guessed it, Dubai. This is one example. Airbus is very active in this world. They've actually bought one of the apps in Sao Paulo, which is one of the only cities with a big helicopter um, infrastructure for very, very rich people, very, very small numbers of very, very rich people. Um, there is now a sort of Uber-style app for helicopters in Sao Paulo. It's now being bought by Airbus, which is interesting. They're seeing it as a sort of transition to this sort of futuristic sky taxi system, which they really want to have flying around London by 2023. They're talking about, they're already doing urban scenarios for how this might actually work, where are they going to take people to, where are they going to drop people off, and so on. NASA and so many others are saying, how can city airspaces accommodate all these drones? What are the sort of legal challenges, safety challenges, anti-terrorism challenges of having um, agricultural drones, drones near airports, Sky taxi drones, hobbyist drones, security and surveillance drones, and so on. And architects are getting on the scene with a whole load of different futuristic notions for sky ports or vertiports or the sorts of infrastructures that will be stations in the sky. Again, how many sci fi films have you seen that don't have flying cars and stations in the sky? Or cars that can just land on any street directly from anywhere? It's long been the dream of architects and sci-fi filmmakers. Whoop. But I think perhaps the biggest concern goes back to the question of anonymity, because once you build biometric systems into smart cities, you, you effectively have a totalitarian regime's fantasy, as far as I can see. You effectively abolish the notion of anonymity completely. And this is not some 
bad remake of a George Orwell or a Minority Report. This stuff is moving so, so quickly with deep learning systems and the contemporary face recognition systems that are embedded in our phones these days, our cameras and so on. The Chinese regime, which is profoundly authoritarian, as we've seen with the um, clampdown on artists and social movements and journalists recently, has pushed the biggest face recognition system in history onto the streets of Chinese cities. And they are very much on to a complete tracking system for the population. They are now able to name and shame jaywalkers remotely. This is not known to any of the, the people who are caught doing this, this um, activity. But they can do that sort of covert tracking through deep learning. Face recognition was always deemed to be a problem because people age, weather changes, people wear hats and so on. Because this is now a deep learning system, it is always continually learning each time it tracks a face. So it's continually adapting in a profoundly concerning way. And what concerns me is that this seems to cons overlap quite a lot with notions of security systems coming out of the US military and the US government. This is the cities under siege work that Toby talked about. How am I doing for time? Toby? What do you reckon? Okay, that's fine. Um, the smart city idea of continually sensing everything and analyzing and preempting and predicting overlaps con completely, it seems to me, with the sort of military idea of how you can secure cities. In the post 9-11 world, the American Homeland Security Department build these systems into particular cities in America. One was called the Oakland Domain Awareness Center, which basically has a lot of the ingredients that we're talking about. It would have video analytics, it would have cameras, sensors, uh, and so on, loads of, loads of different types of sensors for perimeter detection and so on. And it was all about sensing the city and anticipating threat through that dream of real-time information. It was actually not back through a huge protest by local social movements um, and had to change dramatically the way it was, it was uh, enforced. And that shows the importance of those social movements in uh, politicizing what's often presented as a technical and uh, rational development. There you go. The debate was, uh, do you want to live in a surveillance police state? Extra evidence of the depth of the data capture from the security agencies is obviously coming out massively through the various leaks from Snowden, from the, the Pentagon Papers, from um, all of the, the different whistleblower events and so on. And the, the big one was to see the depth of the NSA, the National Security Agencies, capture of data around the world. They have an amazing system for uh, capturing and sieving and sensing data using algorithms. Of course, the volumes here are way beyond anything. This was a revelation of their cryptological platform. They call it SIGINT, which stands for Signals Intelligence. A couple of these big platforms are in north of England, where, where I live, so we're very aware of this. What's Powerful is that the big IT companies willingly give all of their data to the NSA. You can see here, likes of Microsoft, Yahoo, Facebook. These are actually military um, PowerPoint slides that were exposed as part of that revelation. It's called the PRISM system. And it's being used to supply data to vast fusion complexes. This stuff gets enough to get us really paranoid, actually. But um, this is the biggest of the lot. It's a huge fusion complex for bringing all of that harvested data together and trying to understand interconnections with a view to industrial espionage, but also security. This is in, uh, in Western US. But it's also very domestic. You can also see through the work of Trevor Paglin, who's a very interesting geographer who works on exposing the geographies and the urbanisms of what he calls the dark state in America, the black projects, the secret security agencies, everything from Area 51 to CIA rendition. Trevor's on the case, and he's even found some evidence that some of the optic fiber grids in Germany are being 
systematically um, connected to NSA listening systems. I think all of these issues to do with the digitized um, end of anonymity in cities overlap with some of the complex discussions about the political situation we're facing at the moment in ways that really challenge our traditions in Europe of uh, open, liberal, cosmopolitan cities. Um, I think there's a sense that profound changes are underway in the media landscape. Obviously, post-truth um, politics in, in the US, led by, by Trump, has a, a huge bearing here. But I think the, the final point I want to say about the smart city idea is that it's asocial. It's a non-social view of the future. It's an entire technological, technocratic view of the future city, which I think gets the entire um, logic wrong. What we need are social visions of the future of cities, which start with all of the pressing uh, social political concerns, environmental concerns. Then, if digital media are, are part of the solution, that's fine. But uh, they're, they're trying to squeeze every aspect into this more data, more data. Adam Greenfield, who's done some really interesting critical work on smart cities, puts it this way. He says that smart, this is a quote, smart cities tend to be discussed casually as if, as if it were self-evident all one needed to do to finally solve the city, remember the IBM quote earlier on, is to weave sensors into the urban fabric by the million, trawl the relevant social networks for geo-tagged utterances, and apply just the right analytical algorithms to the ever-mounting tally of tetrabytes captured this way. A lot of the smart city labs seem to be full of very, very bright people trying to do stuff just because the data's there, in other words, which I think is a getting it entirely wrong. There are some much more interesting and challenging grassroots social activist platforms. There's a long history of those that I haven't got the expertise to go in, which start with the social. They start with human lives in place and then build from there. This is just one example, which is the work of Christian Nold in East London, who's actually started to tag people as they move around East London to see how stressed they are encountering the pollution and the danger of the various vehicles and highways around East London with a way of mobilizing for environmental and social justice. My final point is to look at infrastructure from the, 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 the perspective of failure and disruption. If you remember, Susan Lay Starr, at the start of this talk, had these quite technical definitions of what makes infrastructure. There were eight of them. I won't go over them again. But the ninth one, I think, is very important. The ninth one is that infrastructure, quote, tends to become visible on breakdown. Because we have this tendency to put all of the systems that keep our lives going in cities into these black boxes, to not see them, even if they're right in front of us. Um, when those systems go, all of a sudden, those infrastructures become visible. It's paradoxical, very paradoxical. And that means that they become more political, because it's hard to make infrastructure political. So much of the debate about infrastructure seems to be technical, engineering, and to a lot of people, boring, okay? Just give you an example of what happens if you take electricity away from a society that depends on it totally. You have all sorts of effects that move around places, that move between places, that move between different infrastructures in ways that we just can't predict until we have the crisis. So you'll have no gas, you'll have no oil, you'll have um, no road transportation, you won't be able to get money out of your ATM and so on and so forth. Just taking electricity away. Electricity is very important because you can't really store it, and yet everything depends on it. We are all hostages to plugging in those bloody smartphones every day, or every two days if you've got a new model. What these events also expose is what, we, what geographers of infrastructure call topological space. 
the way infrastructures, especially digital ones, connect here and now with very far away places that don't seem to be connected at all. And I'll give you an example. I won't read this, I hope you can see this, but effectively in 2001, in July, there was a fire in a railway tunnel in Baltimore, underneath the downtown, okay? Very prosaic little urban event. All of a sudden, many countries in Africa don't have email access, okay? And you think, what on earth is going on here? Well, what's going on is that the internet is, remember, a physical thing, and it connects some places and not others. And the fibers that connect Africa, very few of them, actually, often do via big connections with North America, where the internet was invented. So emails between two countries in, in Africa will be going to perhaps to Washington and then Baltimore back to the country. So a small fire in a tunnel will expose these really complex and hidden and very political geographies. Another example, um, even more powerful. In 2008, a fishing boat off the coast of Alexandria in the Mediterranean caught more than fish and managed to sever one of the key optic fiber lines of the global internet system. All of a sudden, 75 million people in the Middle East and in India don't have internet access. Again, why? Well, you have to look at infrastructure. The geography of the fibers, the optic fibers that make the internet work predominantly, is very localized. And Alexandria is pivotal. But these failures and these, these collapses means that when you have a completely digitized society, completely digitized surveillance system, activists um, have a lot to go at too. Because the evidence is always coming out because that is recorded as well. So whether it be WikiLeaks, the Panama Papers, uh, Snowden, wonderful websites like Cryptone, are continually undertaking what's called Sioux surveillance. Surveillance from the French means um, from on high. Sioux surveillance is from below, where you are challenging those in power because the digital technologies have a very powerful means of capturing what's going on through elite power. And I'll finish with one example that's really powerful. In the Arab Spring, we all saw how social media was being used to sustain challenges to regimes from Egypt, from Tunisia and so on, sometimes with revolutions and so on. In Bahrain, there was another attempted revolution that was prompted by a Google Earth image. Why a Google Earth image? Well, the majority, I always forget whether it's Shia Muslim or Sunni Muslim, excuse me if I'm offending anybody. The, the vast majority of the population living in quite squalid cities uh, could see how the elite who own all of the real estate were privatizing and extending the beaches of Bahrain. They could see all of these new beaches being manufactured for real estate, hotels, and condos, and so on, at the same time as distancing them from their own fishing grounds, their own coastlines. So a new means of visibility, albeit using a sort of highly corporate surveillance system, allows all sorts of new means of challenging those in power. And that was the basis for the mobilization. So I hope this hasn't been a too grim and too but paranoid sense of the, the network and the digitization of, of urban space. What I hope I've given you a, a flavor of is the subtlety of how everyday encounters between people in places, the things that keep and always will keep cities going, is now so completely mediated um, in, in all sorts of ways by a new set of infrastructures. So thanks very much for, for coming. Thanks a lot for this very insightful
uh, journey for your talk, Stephen. Thanks a lot also for the simultaneous translators for translating this into German. I'm always amazed uh, how you do that job. I could never imagine doing that uh, in that kind of pace. So thank you very much that we have that uh, tonight. There's many topics uh, you touched tonight, Stephen. I'd like to just uh, touch a few in a little bit more detail with you, maybe 15 minutes before we open up this discussion for you. And there's still the hashtag actually active, uh, hashtag digital society, where you can ask questions on Twitter. So let's start right away, maybe with the city of Berlin, trying to connect the city of Berlin to some of the things you talked about, Steve. Um, you know, we have a massive um, housing crisis, you could call it. There's a shortage of housing. There are skyrocketing rents, uh, not only in Berlin. It has become... Uh, actually a subject for the federal uh, government as well. Of course, I know there are cities that are a lot worse off in uh, Europe, like London uh, or Paris, but still, relatively speaking, this is a major problem of this, cities and, uh, of this city, Berlin. And I wonder um, if it has anything to do with what you talked about when you, uh, at the beginning of your talk, when you talked about all those, you know, digitally fueled narratives of the end of importance of time and space, you said digitization facilitates urbanization, place matters as much as ever. And I wonder if this actually has led to this, um, how do you want to say it, to this late reaction of many cities that this problem will occur eventually. I mean, couldn't it have been foreseen like decades ago? And does this narrative, this ideology of the cyberspace that sort of abolishes the need for space, does it lead to this in some way? Is there a connection? That's a really great question. I mean, I think we have to go back to the days of the 60s and 70s, particularly in, say, the US and perhaps other parts of, of Europe, to see that the cities were really in trouble. You know, New York went bankrupt in the mid-1970s. There was a profound sense of anyone who could, in, could leave cities, and this is often highly racialized in the US, was leaving cities. Mm. Um, the suburbs were where it's at, the technological suburbs, the edge cities were where it's at. So the, the cyberspace thing was coming very much out of that culture, mm -hmm. which was not really a European culture. In Europe, it was the old industrial cities that were really in trouble. The renaissance of cities is fueled by all sorts of things, and it was not foreseen in many, in many debates as far as I can see. It's been fueled by certainly an economic motor. Many sectors that are driving the new technological economy thrive on urbanization. They thrive on highly dense co-location. They need cities because that's where the infrastructure is, because that's where the skills are, because that's where the cool people are. And all of that has driven this gentrification process in certain cities which are hubs for the new digital economy. Not every city is by any means, but in parts of certainly the high-tech cities like San Francisco and London, gentrification is partly fueled by that. Um, but I think it was missed, and it was really missed, on, you know, unpredictable and perhaps unexpected dynamics have emerged. You know, who'd have thought that a couple of platforms like an EasyJet website and an Airbnb website could have huge gentrification impacts in European cities. Why? Because EasyJet is now so much cheaper than the old nationalized aircraft airlines. It's cheaper because it's got a new business model, which is remediated, remember that word, because you are doing all the work at the front end um, and everything is stripped down to allow it to be so cheap. Because it's so cheap, people are using it in the way they used buses 40 years ago. How does that impact on cities? Well, they're going to cool cities, like Berlin, Amsterdam, and um, Barcelona, in numbers that no one could have expected. Why is that an impact on housing? Well, then Airbnb gets in, which is another platform, which is um, massively transforming how housing markets work in cities. And unless you're careful, all of those central communities will just be pushed away, because how can any a uh, renter in a city compete with an EasyJet influx going paying premium money in an Airbnb platform. You know, so. 
Well, Berlin actually did react to that, uh, to Airbnb, and made it a lot harder to rent out your apartment uh, or to put it up on, on Airbnb unless you actually live in it for yourself. You can rent out like a room or two, but you cannot rent out the whole apartment unless you get some kind of permit, which is hard to get, as I am told, in some houses. I mean, so I there, is a, there is a possibility for the city, actually, yeah. to react to that. I mean, I think this is a new territory for urban planners and for urban managers and so on. How do you um, deal with being too successful, being too popular? You know, I mean, this is bizarre because the last 40 years, anyone in urbanism and urban planning has been desperate to market themselves, to be a center, to be a, to be a hub. And now we're having to think of how do we turn people away? How do we discourage this sort of stuff? It's, it's a new paradigm, which is fascinating. You talked a little bit about, you know, grassroots-led initiatives to counter all that kind of corporate data, data uh, harvesting, to counter all those gentrification processes that are linked to what you have talked about. Can you give us an example or two of what those grassroots-led initiatives uh, or cooperatives could look like? Yeah, I mean... Or do look like. The environmental justice movement is in the States is very powerful at trying to... Um, understand how the algorithms of insurance companies are used to dis disadvantage certain cities. So they're trying to sort of reverse engineer um, how what's called redlining happens. Because so many of the biases and prejudices and exclusions in cities are now done through postcodes, through geographically referenced data. If you're in the wrong neighborhood, you're, you're going to struggle to get a mortgage, you're going to struggle to get financial services, uh, and you are redlined. It happens in more subtle ways in Europe. But some of these um, activist communities are actually you know, getting real experts on, on the algorithms to say, actually, this is illegal, or this is you know, trying to expose the agency of the algorithm in a way that makes it much less of a technical thing. Because the challenge is always to politicize the technical. The technical is always political. There is some kind of philosophical, maybe cultural notion uh, in your talk when you um, spoke about infrastructure as being veiled and unveiled. That the disruption and, and you know, non-functioning of the infrastructure um, makes it visible and only that. And you talked about electrification as well in Berlin or in uh, New York. Um, now, nowadays, in many uh, U.S. cities I know, or Japanese cities, actually, electrification is still highly visible. The cables are overground, uh, which they are not anywhere uh, I know in Europe of, at least. Do you think that actually changed people's relation to infrastructure of a city? Is there a cultural difference you could describe uh, with that between, say, the U.S., Japan, and Europe? It's a complex history. There is a whole discipline of urban history, and they're starting to get really into the sort of differences. And you know, I'm, I'm using these really general narratives, and there's clearly very distinct differences. I think there's a general similarity, for example, with water. Water systems, when they were first built, were incredibly visible because you know cities had dealt with the terrible health consequences of bad water mm. for centuries. So you go to some of the, the water pumping stations around Europe built in the 19th century, they are like cathedrals, you know, they, were, they are made to be visible. Water st pumping stations now are the most anonymous concrete and steel things that no one ever thinks about, no one looks. So those are being veiled. Certain infrastructures are now being celebrated, you know, like telecom towers, Alexanderplatz, of course. Mm -hmm. um, is, I was is, from is, a different country. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, in terms, yeah, of course, the, they were symbolic of national arrival and national modernity and, and all of those sorts of things. But I think, you know, we're all seeing those moments when these things are, are unveiled. I'll, I'll give you a, a brilliant example. When, the, um, when the, the flights across the Atlantic were, were stopped because of the volcano that nobody could pronounce in, in, in Iceland. Iceland. I cannot pronounce on, it either. Pronounce yeah. it. No, no, please. A, a thousand <laughs> consonants all having a fight was, was, was my best. Um, basically, all of a sudden, newspapers that normally don't deal with technology, they had cross sections of aero engines all over the world for about two days, and we were learning all about aero engines and so on. The same happened with Fukushima. For two days, the whole world had cross sections of nuclear reactors. Um, and then, once the crisis goes, they are veiled back again into, into, the, into the background. So, uh, you know, it's, 
there are generalizations, but there are also very different specificities because you have different national infrastructural cultures. The French tradition is particular because it was so central to the way um, the Republic was built after the Revolution. It was about modernity, it was about the metric system, it was about l'excellent, centralized on Paris. So infrastructures were there about creating the nation of France as a modern, rational, technical space. Mm -hmm. In Disrupted Cities, the book you edited, I think, in 2010, you write uh, extensively about uh, you know, the interruption of infrastructure becoming useless junk. You write there, you write about blackouts and gridlocks um, and so forth in, in cities. Now, um, okay, that's eight years ago. We've seen a lot of growth uh, since 2010, digitally speaking, uh, at least, and in terms of the smart city. You talked about um, there's a lot of growth, there's a lot of acceleration, uh, you could say. Um, you know, maybe a little nod to Paul Virilio, who died uh, last week. You quoted in a different context here, I know. Uh, but this has definitely, uh, um, you know, become a phenomenon on a much different scale than uh, 2010. What would you say now, 2018, uh, to what you wrote about in 2010? What's the, what's the agency there? Is it just to handle this growth differently, or is actually degrowth one of the concepts oh, to go well, for? Well, as I was saying earlier, I think this is a really interesting question because you know there's been a long debate about the ecological impacts of cities and how we need to change the economy so that it's not devastating the earth's biosphere and creating this anthropocenic crisis and so on but now um, yeah cities are almost struggling with being too popular there are moments in London which are genuinely terrifying um, because of the crowdedness we shouldn't forget that our debates in these conversations is very geared towards global north mm -hmm. cities where infrastructures still, despite the crises and collapses, are pretty reliable and pretty decent. We need to stress that for the billion of the world's urbanites who live in self-made settlements, shanty towns, sometimes pejoratively labeled slums, the whole idea of taking infrastructure for granted is a complete dream. You know, a huge amount of everyday life in those communities is about how do you improvise infrastructure? How do you steal power? How do you get water to stop your children getting cholera? So we need to be careful in our north-centric discussions that we don't talk about the bigger crisis, arguably, which is to do with global urbanization in mega cities in the global south, which are horrendously poorly served in terms of infrastructures, particularly water and power. And that fa brings fascinating challenges because Mumbai is trying to be the next Shanghai. That's the elite, right? The elite model. They're obsessed with being the next Shanghai. But how do they do that if their stock exchange doesn't even have 24-hour electricity, right? In a 24-hour global economy, that's a little bit of a problem. Um, so again, there's a lot of highly politicized efforts to build infrastructural rights into urban rights in, in many global south cities. So I would say that's where the, the real challenges are. We have huge challenges in the North too, but we need to be mindful of that. We have talked quite a bit in this uh, series actually about algorithms uh, from uh, different perspectives. And um, you showed this beautiful IBM slide from 2012 from the control room in Rio um, de Janeiro. Um, the quote goes, just to refresh that maybe um, quickly, cities lack the ability to extract meaningful information out of the date of the uh, of the data they collect, IBM said in 2012. Now, this is typical internet centrism. We've encountered that uh, almost on a daily basis. Uh, on a daily basis, there's this book by Yevgeny Morozov that says to save everything, click here. That pretty much sums up that kind of thinking. Um, the question remains the same, though. What is the alternative to better algorithms that actually solve some of those problems? they were invented for in the beginning? Because these debates are often so technical and so depoliticized, I think they often camouflage the social problems that they are ostensibly designed to help. You know, getting more data about the social and environmental crises of Rio doesn't necessarily help solve those problems. You might have more data about those problems in a, in a, in a better managed um, platform, 
but ultimately the the rampant injustices and crises going on in and around the favelas of Rio carry on. Okay, so I think this is really important point that the politics of cities remain the politics of cities, however the data is harvested, sensed, and represented. And you need broader social challenges founded in social and political conversations to challenge and transform those. That's always been the case and that always will be the case. Well, some of those discussions are somehow arriving in northern cities as well. Maybe I can tap into um, some kind of current uh, fears or subjects that are, um, mm, you know, uh, getting a lot of media coverage in Germany. And uh, there is an outburst, or people think there is an outburst, of uh, right-wing extremists patrolling certain cities. Uh, certain people of certain color, of certain descent, do not feel comfortable anymore. Um, there's houndings, there's hunts. Uh, and there's this kind of, uh, you know, discussion about what is a hunt, what is a hounding, on the highest political levels. So in a time like this, it's very hard uh, to argue actually against uh, surveillance. And all of a sudden, there's this, uh, there's this shift with this um, public insecurity that is definitely taking place and changing political discourse now. I don't want to, in, don't want to imply that surveillance is, is inherently bad. Mm -hmm. You know, try raising children without intense parental <laughs> surveillance. Your children will be dead in an hour. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a fundamental part of every social relationship to have surveillance. Um, it's a question of the politics of surveillance. There are many, many great opportunities for surveillance. The un, the um, counter surveillance. Yeah, even. counter surveillance. Mm -hmm. Think of the Rodney King episode. Think of the many events, the many protests against globalization. Think of many of the protests against political summits, where the the exposure of police violence through global media, global digital networks, and so on has a massive impact in terms of changing the mood, changing the levels of sympathy. Think of the Bahraini example I talked about before. There are many human rights organizations across the world that are using Google Earth really, really intensively to uh, challenge authoritarian regimes. There are many scholars like Eil Weissman who are using new sensing technologies incredibly powerfully to address war crimes um, committed by particularly Israel and, and Western countries. So I'm by no means suggesting that surveillance is a bad thing. It's a question of um, how do we prevent the really worrying uh, possibilities of a sort of Chinese-style permanent tracking society? And how do we mobilize the technologies to do that? Another example would be, you wrote about, I think, in vertical cities, uh, the Greek government looking for tax evaders and checking Google Maps for swimming pools around Athens. And what they did then is cover up their swimming pools with tarpaulins. Yeah. Uh, that's one of yeah. the examples you cited. I thought that was pretty funny. But I think now is the time to open this discussion to you. There's one or two microphones, I'm not quite sure, uh, for the audience. It's right there. And uh, a little bit later on, we're asking for the Twitter wall. But there's somebody in the back. I cannot see that clearly. But yeah. It's not on. Hi, thank you for the talk. My question also goes to this uh, big and messy field of alternatives. And I wonder what's your take on attempts to uh, appropriate the smart city? When you think about infrastructures, also there's been some debate of owning infrastructure. Barcelona is celebrated as an example where they say, uh, tr try to combine smart city with participatory democracy in order to create a different narrative around it. Some of this also spilled over to Berlin. And I just wonder, what's your take on this idea? Is it like if a city builds their own platform, is it um, a possibility? Is it a way to make a difference or generally? Yeah, um, Yeah, I think it's a really great question. I would say it's an area of great possibility, absolutely. Because, you know, the history of infrastructure is one of municipal, municipal authorities taking control. So much of what was done creatively in terms of the history of transportation systems and highway systems and water and things, all the things that are now the basis for urban life started with um, those sorts of municipal efforts to 
socialize and create public infrastructure in cities as, as resources for citizens. So I don't see why that tradition can't bounce back, despite the fact it's very unfashionable in a world of privatization and neoliberalization. I think there's a long history of, in, even in digital media, of cities trying to build platforms for their own, for their own use, which create their own spaces that are less prone to the sort of corporate um, excesses of the, of the big IT companies. The history of virtual communities, the history of virtual cities, the history of community uh, IT networks goes right back to the, the 70s and 80s, actually. And you can even look earlier on with cable TV in the, in the 1960s. So I think it's a very exciting development. There's a gentleman in the first row to make a comment or ask a question. Thank you very much for a great talk. Um, I, I have a question that might, might sound stupid actually, but I'm not sure. So um, you were talking about infrastructure a lot and you also were so kind to explain us what you understand as um, infrastructure. You were also um, talking about platforms a lot, but you weren't really defining what um, a platform means to you or maybe I didn't hear it. So I was wondering how like the the concept infrastructure relates to platform, in, in your opinion? Um, I'm not by any means an expert on platforms, but I think what's, what's so powerful about the contemporary dynamics is that huge swathes of infrastructure in terms of the traditional idea of the world, you know, like a global airline system or a global um, electricity system or, or, or global transportation systems, can now very much be organized through a sort of screen interface which is the platform. Um, and that allows the remediation dynamics to change everything. Think of Uber as a classic example. You know, a whole, rather than a whole traditional network of taxis, which are hailed by perhaps telephone or the traditional way, you now have the platform as the interface between the infrastructure, which is now highly privatized, often highly um, individualized, you know, it's used by the company to take away social protections from drivers and so on. Um, but it provides a, a radically new way of, of organizing, managing and running what was the taxi system. And that's no surprise that the traditional taxi organizations are, are up in arms at fighting that from a point of view of social conditions, but also from the point of view that they could potentially go, literally go, because they can't compete on price. So I think the, the relationship between Uber and the taxi system is a classic example of how platform politics interfaces with infrastructural politics. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, thank you for your talk. My name is Matthew Stinder. I'm a Berlin-based tech ethicist. Um, I'm just going to step here for a second. I was wondering if uh, you could talk about the, the how, how two things match up. Um, you use the word black, black boxes as in kind of the covering a casing, an external casing for the way in which that infrastructure is concealed. Um, I wonder if you also use the phrase black boxes as um, a synonym for uh, proprietary algorithms, and if you see any connection between kind of a black box algorithm versus black box infrastructure. But also talking about like kind of the next billion, people in the global south or however we define it. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the interplay between agency and identity, and the way in which that as public-private partnerships are a new vector of technological infrastructure, the way that n perhaps that the city, the municipality, is losing its capacity to infer and confer identity on its inhabitants, not just citizens, but inhabitants, and how you see that going forward, um, and where you see the role of individuals, let's say, let's take sub-Saharan Africa, in which that may have limited uh, institutional capacity in the municipalities, but also see kind of the Cisco's and the IBM's or the Facebook's as an easy R&D remedy to kind of leapfrog current uh, municipal woes, let's say. Thank you. Um, wow, there's a lot, lot in there. I think um, on the black boxing point, clearly it's a concept that applies to all sorts of technological worlds. Um, and it's certainly appropriate to the highly uh, problematic efforts by the big IT companies to be 
deeply proprietary, and you know, it, it's it's a way of reducing scrutiny to the algorithmic powers that we're all talking about in just making the catch-all phrase that this is a proprietary corporate system and is is not um, able to be unblackboxed. Uh, it reaffirms that that sense of of power and control and a removal from democratic or social scrutiny. In terms of the the wider sort of dynamics of identity, infrastructure, and power, yes, I think many many city agencies feel powerless because they they often don't have any technological expertise to take on the big technological behemoths, and they can be very, you know, these smart city visions can be superficially very seductive. You know, they can really, really think we're going to be. Um, going to the future much more quickly. We're going to have the experts on hand. We're going to look glossy and, and futuristic like eco-Atlantic. Uh, we're going to be up there with the big boys, and it is normally always boys, of course. Um, so there's a real, a real huge amount of work necessary from you know, ethicists like yourself to try and get away from this sort of seductive mythology and to try and look much more closely at how questions of cultural and social identity interface with, with media in all sorts of forms, to find ways of perhaps um, upscaling uh, infrastructural possibilities in much more sensitive ways. I think the history of the appropriate technology movement is really interesting here, um, to find ways of socially shaping technologies. And we should remember there's a huge amount of flexibility in how these things are actually run in ways that are appropriate to, to each place rather than just imposing the cookie-cutter behemoth of the IBM urban operating system willy-nilly around the world. Okay, let me ask real quick if there's anything up on Twitter that uh, you would like to share with us. Yes, there are a few questions, um, so I'd like to read the first of them. How do we prevent the permanent tracking city like in China? Wow. Um, that's <laughs> a, it's a really good question. I mean, clearly the Chinese case is quite an extreme one because you still have a deeply authoritarian one-party system which has enormous amounts of control on um, the likes of uh, internet access and so on. So it's, despite being the most urbanized the biggest urban population in the world, there is the possibility there of that hyper-central control. I think that is a sort of scary big brother world, but in most cities we have hundreds of little brothers, perhaps, is the best way of describing it. And I think the, despite the fact these silos are becoming more interconnected, there's a lot of mess, there's a lot of chaos, and there's still a lot of massive uncertainty in how these things work. Often they don't work, often they don't connect. I'm not being, being complacent. What we seriously need are much more robust data protection and um, data regulations in, in contemporary Western societies. At the moment, those organizations exist, but they're often toothless, they're often badly resourced, and they're often way behind the curve in terms of what's going on in the sort of corporate and smart city developments. So the second question is related to this. Will we be able to influence such developments in advance or are we bound to repair things after they go wrong? Do you see changes for policymakers to set up guiding frameworks for the digital society? I think again there are many, many challenges because um, again the sort of ways in which smart city ideas are being sold is very seductive. It taps into um, these deeply held notions about being modern, being futuristic, being switched on. Um, many of our public policy communities are struggling to have the level of expertise, again, necessary to really intervene, to really understand how these things can be regulated in highly globalized, highly uncertain ways when a small number of trillion dollar behemoths have so much power and I think it's it's a big challenge I'm not sure if it's doable but it certainly needs needs to happen 
Okay. Is there maybe one more question uh, on Twitter before we switch back to the live audience? Or Yeah, there's, there's one more. It's okay. about infrastructure. So um, the person's asking, I am skeptical of the notion that digital infrastructure should always aspire toward a notion of perfect optimization. Inefficiencies exist in any system and externalities are not always priced. I would counter with the question, for whom is networked infrastructure optimized? I couldn't agree more. Um, this is a myth of optimization. As anyone knows who's used IT systems in practice over a sustained amount of time, there's a huge amount of failure, a huge amount of glitches, a huge amount of stuff going wrong. It is always suboptimal. These are dreams of control that are part of the sales pitch. Anyone who's ever worked on any of these systems in practice, whether in, in public administration or in, in private sector economies, they know that these, these things are more or less work some of the time. And sometimes people aren't even sure why they work. You know, there are so many layers of software going on in different systems that they more or less work some of the time. So yeah, I think we need to remember this is the seductive ideology of perfect optimization that is a big part of the sales pitch. Please. Thank you. Uh, a question directly connected to one of the questions uh, beforehand that the repair mode, do we only have the repair mode uh, because after the not foreseeable can, uh, developments into the future, the political, uh, political arena, for instance, is uh, only reacting to the developments they didn't foresee. Uh, do you consider it feasible that any already in the political arena existing concept on the EU level, on national level, on city level, on whatever we call it, uh, level of uh, regions and so on. Is there maybe today already one ministry or any other body uh, having the kind of an overall concept uh, being in connection with you and anything like that with a scientific arena maybe as well? Like um, a little bit to be able to foresee what is going to be in the future, that we are not only in the repair mode. Um, no. <laughs> no, not in my experience. I, th I think, you know, the, the fact is the future is profoundly unpredictable and, and always has been and always will be. And the dynamics of uncertainty now are on such a huge scale, whether it be to do precisely because of these tightly interconnected digital infrastructures that are globalized, that connect the financial and technological architectures of our world so tightly. A tiny, small problem can, as we saw with the financial crash in 2012, um, was it 2012? Earlier than that, 2007, sorry, can, can cascade out into huge and unpredictable crises. So by definition, it's profoundly unpredictable. Um, and that's why it, it's, it's enormously challenging. The world is full of and littered with technological failures. You know, the, the underground of cities is full of technological failures, the detritus of previous attempts to be the future. And I think that's, we have to look at this as a cultural phenomenon. You know, we are all in cities which are messy amalgams of previous futures which is the joy of the city. And there's so much stuff in the city that we can learn from. I think one thing we need to do is to learn from history um, and to learn from the detritus of previous futures, um, which are often ironically ruined around us. You know. There's an amazing example, actually, that human beings have mined so much copper that apparently, this, this sounds a bit, why is that relevant? Well, it's relevant because we're now having to mine our own cities for the metals that we've used in previous futures um, because that's where the copper is. Mm. So let's look at this in a sort of deep archaeological sense. Media archaeology is the in thing. Um, and let's try and take a bigger grand durée rather than a, a modernist sense of being able to foresee the future. If I could, see, could foresee the future, I'd be a very rich man because I would be betting. <laughs> 
all of my salary. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get back to the present uh, for uh, closing this discussion here. It's already 8.45. I was told to close at 45. Forgive my Swiss compulsion of punctuality. I just can't help it. Maybe just one last question we usually uh, do at the very end is, uh, again, we've touched this a little bit so far, actually, European outlook on things, because we've talked a lot about U.S. policy, about U.S. cities. We talked about the Gulf. We talked about China uh, and face recognition and so forth. Uh, let's talk about Europe a little bit, you know, being sandwiched in between those digital superpowers, uh, because this is what those series is about. I mean, there are things, there are ways of countering that. I mean, the EU is trying to, you know, tax multinational corporations a little bit more properly. In Berlin, there's this initiative that one of the um, bike sharing companies is actually getting state money. It's one of those companies that does a little less aggressive data harvesting than the two Chinese companies that are uh, into business as well in Berlin that probably are going to make the race. But we don't know. I mean, there are certain things you can do, but what else can we do? Is there actually a genuinely European uh, um, forms of agency or an outlook on those topics you've touched? I think as Europeans, we are really bad at asserting our strengths and our differences to the, to the Asian traditions or the North American traditions. The UK has been far too swayed towards the US in the last 30, 40 years. And I think that's part of the deep prehistory of this Brexit nightmare that we're all having to inhabit at the moment, which is very, very, very um, sort of relevant to the conversation. In terms of geopolit geopolitics, Europe faces big challenges, as you say. Demographically, it's, it's, it's not been able to grow, and that f raises all sorts of questions around cosmopolitanism, around mm. migration. You know, German, the German birth rate traditionally is, is really low. So in terms of our futures, perhaps we need to put aside the digital and just think through what are our societies going to be in terms of demography? in terms of populations, in terms of a balanced age profile for our society as we age and age and age and so on. Because one thing for sure, we're really old compared to East Asia and North America. And that, and that is really vital economically, in terms of culture, in terms of the ability to organize cities, the ability to provide services and infrastructures for cities. Um, and this is where we have these huge contradictions with the, the shift to the right. The shift to the right is all about protection and ethno-nationalism and putting walls and barriers up. To, for Europe to have a really strong position in the future, I think we have to embrace a, a radical cosmopolitan future based on mixed up messy cities which completely challenge all of the right-wing traditions which, which are hating those places. So I think this is profoundly to do with identity politics and the role of big, messy cities fueled by global migration, because those are the ways of surviving and prospering for Europe, as far as I can see, which is completely against the rhetoric of Brexit, the rhetoric of the far right across Europe, of course. It's funny you're ending on a sort of carbon or human or analog note uh, this whole evening. You also talked about books, and we actually have a present. I have to look for it. Where is it, Christian? Behind what? Ah. It's hidden there, and you sort of asked for it. It is a book, and now uh, you'll find out soon what it is about. Thanks a lot, Steve Grant, for making the journey from Newcastle to Berlin. Thanks a lot for this very inspiring talk. This is the analog book. Thanks for very you. much yeah. for coming. <laughs> Thanks for holding out. Could, could, could I also ask that we thank Toby for doing such a great job?